this is our pre-lab lecture discussion um, over our laboratory for this week. In this case, it's the Williamson Ether Synthesis. The Williamson Ether Synthesis uses an SN2 reaction to create the ether. It's an SN2 reaction of an alkoxide with an alkyl halide to make an ether. Now, our product is also going to have some acid-base properties, so we're going to have to do a selective extraction with a specific base to isolate our product from other materials that might be in the reaction mixture. Okay, so, as I said, the Williamson synthesis is an SN2 reaction to make an ether. And so, we will use an alkoxide, right? And note the two hydrogens here. We have to use a primary alkyl halide as the electrophile. So our alkoxide will be the nucleophile. We'll use a primary alkyl halide, both so that we can get an effective um, attack on the carbon, right? It's not restricted sterically. And remember that if we have secondary or tertiary alkyl halides with a strong base like an alkoxide, we get more illumination than substitution in either SN2 or SN1, right? So we have to be primary so that we get substitution more than illumination, okay? So, our starting materials are going to be um, cresols, right? The common name for these materials is cresols. So, cresols are methyl phenols, right? So, a phenol is an aromatic ring with a hydroxyl group on it. That is a phenol. A methyl phenol... is a cresol. Okay? Now, there are three different potential arrangements of methyl phenols. There's a 2-methylphenol, which in common language we call ortho, right? The 2-methylphenol is called ortho, and that would be the orthocresol. If we have 3-methylphenol, Right? That's called meta, right? So we have ortho, that's the O, meta, that's the M, or M cresol, 4 methylphenol, the symmetrical one, is the, it's called para cresol. Now, our challenge is, right, we're going to start with one of these cresols, but you don't know what it is. And so the way that that is specified in a structural discussion is you put the methyl group, this is saying this methyl group is attached on the ring somewhere. It could be ortho, it could be meta, it could be para, but we don't know the structure. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our cresols, we don't know which one we're starting with, we're going to create our ether product, and the melting points of the ether products are very different. And so by the melting point of the ether product, we can come back and identify, right, the melting point of the ether will help us identify which cresol we started with. Okay, now, the thing about phenols is that phenols have pKa's around 10, okay? Now, an alcohol has a pKa of around 18. 
right? Phenols have a pKa around 10 because phenols can be resonance stabilized. The negative charge on the, right, if it's a phenol, we can be more specific and we can call it a phenoxide, right? So this would be a methyl phenoxide ion. And we can see that the methyl phenoxide is stabilized by resonance, right? The electrons can come here, electrons can move here, and part of the negative charge can be shared with that carbon in the ring. But we can draw another resonance structure where we share electron density, the negative charge, with that carbon in the ring, and we can move electrons around to create another resonance structure where we share negative charge with that carbon in the ring. So a phenol is a stronger acid than an alcohol because the phenoxide conjugate base is stabilized by resonance. Right? In the same way, a carboxylic acid is an even stronger acid because when it deprotonates, right, you get a carboxylate ion. That carboxylate undergoes resonance so that the negative charge is shared between the two oxygens. Right, so negative charge on an electronegative atom is more stable than negative charge shared with less electronegative atoms. But that's more stable than negative charge having to be held by only one atom. So, carboxylic acids are stronger acids than phenols. Phenols are stronger acids than alcohol. Okay, so here are our potential reactions going on in this reaction mixture. So first, we're going to start with chloroacetic acid, right? Chloro, one carbon, two carbons, right? So the chloro, two carbon, carboxylic acid. Well, chloroacetic acid, we'll have chloroacetic acid in the reaction mixture, and we will have our phenol, of unknown structure in the reaction mixture. And so when we put this in, we just said a carboxylic acid is a stronger acid than a phenol. So the first reaction we have to think about is the straightforward acid-base reaction of our chloroacetic acid acting as a Bronsted-Lowry acid to make the chloroacetate. All right, so we'll have the chloroacetate. And so we have to put in enough potassium hydroxide to react with the chloroacetic acid. Then we want to make our phenoxide ion because that phenoxide ion is going to be the nucleophile. So there has to be enough potassium hydroxide left over to react with the weaker acid, the methylphenol, the cresol, to deprotonate it to create our phenoxide ion that we will use as a nucleophile. So you have to put in enough potassium hydroxide to react with both Bronsted-Lowry acids in the mixture. Now, now that we've cr created our phenoxide ion, it can act as a nucleophile. And so it will attack the primary position on the chloroacetic acid, where the chloride ion is, right? So that is a primary position. It's susceptible to SN2 attack. You know we get inversion of the configuration, but since there's two hydrogens, that doesn't matter. So there's our SN2. Right? This is our SN2 step. Right? That will make the carboxylate salt of our ether product. Right? Now, there's also the potential for competing reactions in here. So there is a potential that the hydroxide ion could act as a nucleophile instead of the phenoxide ion. Right? That the hydroxide ion could act as a nucleophile. 
and we could get a hydroxy acetate as a product, as an unwanted side reaction, right? And so one thing you always have to be aware of in organic chemistry is the potential for a side reaction. And so this is a potential side reaction. Okay, so now we want to recover our um, materials. And as long, you know, if we go back to general chemistry, as long as they are the potassium salts, we know they are going to be soluble in water, right? That's one of our solubility rules from general chemistry. So one of the ways to try to make them less soluble in water is to make them not ionic compounds. And the way we can do that is by adding hydrochloric acid to the reaction mixture, right? Hydrochloric acid in water, the hydronium ion is your strongest acid, but the hydronium ion is a stronger acid than any of the potential product acids. So we can, if there's any unreacted phenol left, putting hydrochloric acid in will reprotonate that and make it less soluble in water, right? Unprotonated cresol would be reprotonated. If there's any unreacted chloroacetic acid, it would be reprotonated to make, right, chloroacetic, you know, any unprotonated chloroacetate, unreacted chloro, <coughs> excuse me, unreacted chloroacetate would go to chloroacetic acid. If there's any of our unwanted side product, our hydroxyacetic acid, then it would be reprotonated, or I'm sorry, hydroxyacetate to hydroxyacetic acid. And if we have our wanted ether product in its carboxylate form, it would be protonated to form our ether acid product, right? Our methyl phenoxyacetic acid product, right? So we add hydrochloric acid to the reaction mixture to force all of these into their protonated and uncharged forms. Okay? Now, at this point, we start an extraction. So the first thing we'll do is we will take that protonated mixture, right? We'll take that protonated mixture that has, should have all of that in there. Now, some of them may precipitate out. We'd expect this to be insoluble in water. We'd expect this to be insoluble in water. These two are small enough and polar enough, right, with the carboxylate groups and the hydroxyl groups, that these two probably are still soluble in water. And so we're going to take advantage of that. We will add ethyl acetate and use our separatory funnel. The ethyl acetate should dissolve these larger, less polar molecules. They should go into the ethyl acetate layer while the smaller molecules should stay in the acid, the acidic aqueous layer. And so you should be able to separate the unreacted cresol, if there is any, and your product from any unreacted chloroacetic acid and any unwanted byproduct, the hydroxyacetic acid. And I apologize, in my copy there, it appears that I lost a hydrogen right there. Okay? And so, if you're looking at the reaction, right, um, the potassium carbonate, oh, right, now we're going to put in potassium carbonate. I probably should have put this on the next slide. Right, so we're going to do a second extraction, but with potassium carbonate. Right, so potassium carbonate will be put in. Right, if you put it in with the acid layer, it will decompose and you'll get carbon dioxide and water. Right, that would be gas. So we're not going to add this to the aqueous layer. We're going to add an aqueous solution of potassium carbonate to 
the organic layer. So you'll separate this, right? You'll separate this, right? Drain this out of your separatory funnel. And then we will work with the ethyl acetate layer in the next step. Okay? So now we'll have our ethyl acetate layer and we'll have our potassium carbonate aqueous, right? Now, I didn't copy the pKa's, but remember, the pKa for a phenol is around 10, right? And a cresol is a phenol. The pKa of that carboxylate, right? The carboxylate is around 5. Right? So this is a much stronger acid than this one. And so we use a weaker base. The potassium carbonate is a weaker base. Right? If we use something strong, like potassium hydroxide, we would expect that both would react to create a salt. But if we use a weaker base, like potassium carbonate, the potassium carbonate will react with the strong acid, but will not react with the weaker acid, right? So the potassium carbonate will react with the carboxylate to create a potassium salt here, right? That potassium salt is soluble in water, right? The potassium salt is soluble in water. The weaker acid, right? The phenol will not react. It will stay in the organic, the ethyl acetate layer. And when we drain them off, we can then separate, right? So this then is separated in an aqueous layer that we can isolate. But now we want to get it back as a solid so if we add hydrochloric acid again, we can reprotonate that, right? We can reprotonate that, right? Note the group there and there. That precipitates as a solid, and then we can isolate our ether. And then by doing the melting point, we can determine whether it's ortho, meta, or para. And so, if we look at the potential isomers of our product, we can see that our products have fairly distinct melting points. If it's ortho, it has a fairly high melting point, 152. If it's meta, it has a low melting point, 103. And if it's para, it has an intermediate point, one, melting point, 137. And so, we can use melting point right? Those are all easily within our melting point range. And we can use that then to identify which starting material we had. If you have any questions, please come and ask. Um, I hope this helps you prepare for lab this week.